first. You're going first. Sure. Right? Because I'm so sorry. Don't touch anything. All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Whoa, that's loud. Uh, so this is Passion the Torch, uh, old school rep teaming, new school tactics. I'm uh, Dave McGuire. I lead a team over at Varus Group. Uh, we call it the Adaptive Threat Division. Uh, we do pen testing, red teaming, threat replication, that kind of thing. Uh, previously, um, I was over at NSA's red team. Uh, I think there's a couple people in the audience from the same place. Um, I developed a couple, to, uh, a couple classes, mainly taught at Black Hat, uh, pen testing, and red teaming. I'm Will Schrader. I go by the handle HarmJoy. I'm uh, the, kind of the chief security researcher and red teamer for the Adaptive Threat Division under Dave. I'm a co-founder and one of the main developers for the Veil framework. And I always ask this now, but how many people use Veil Evasion or one of the other tools in a regular... That's awesome. Uh, so I talked at ShmooCon with Christopher Trunser, the other developer, on AV Evasion with the Veil framework and released a new tool called Pillage at DEF CON. So I wrote most of the PowerShell stuff in the framework, which you're going to heavily go over today. And I'm an active Cortana and PowerShell hacker. Cool. So kind of real quick what we're going to go over today. We have a lot of material. We're hoping, you know, we don't have to rush through stuff. We're kind of going to get everyone on the same page, go over pen testing versus red teaming, kind of our interpretations of it. We're not claiming to create some universal definition. We're just, you know, trying to get you to see it from our perspective. We're going to go over red teaming and its different forms versus red team operations. Again, kind of our interpretation. Then we're going to go over five kind of tactical areas that you can uh, perform on a red team and also how some of this tradecraft can be pushed down to pen testing. We're not going to go over complete steps for an op. There's, there's missing points here. There's missing kind of pieces. This isn't a complete, complete chain, but these are the areas we want to focus on. And in each tactic, we're going to show you kind of the overview, the old school way to do it, and kind of an updated new school way to do it. And then we're going to have a demo where he's going to show it the old slow way, and I'm going to show it the awesome new PowerShell way. And I'm going to win. Yeah, thank you. Basically, this entire talk is my, my attempts to torture Will and his hacks to get out of it, which is really lame. Um, so kind of level set people real quick on, uh, on what we're sort of talking about. Obviously, pen testing has some really wide definitions about what is a pen test. We're not going to get into that. Um, how we kind of approach it, though, when we're out there with clients is that we try to strike some type of reasonable balance. So generally, a pen test is something, you know, you have a limited time frame. Uh, you're attempting to find as many maybe exploit paths uh, as possible, uh, trying to demonstrate some impact, you know, showing some risk to the system, but you're not really diving real down, deep down the chain. Um, going to red teaming, you know, Red teaming versus red team operations. I think it's kind of universally accepted, I guess, that red teaming is sort of, you know, something more than pen testing, right? Uh, some people, you know, for some people it's more heavily focused on physical ops, some more heavily focused on social engineering, uh, some more heavily focused on like exploit dev, that type of thing. Uh, but the kind of common theme is that, you know, it's, it's more than pen testing, right? You know, it's like we're doing it for a couple weeks, we have more skill set with the people, that kind of thing. Um, you know, the way we define red team, or the, the way we define red team operations really comes from the military, um, which, you know, the way the DOD does it, which is kind of more of a evolved from adversarial thinking exercises to adversarial emulation on, emulation on the network. Um, and really kind of trying to, what is an, what is a, a, a attacker going to do? And how are they going to look on the network? How can you catch them? That kind of thing. So, um, Will's going to go over kind of, you know, what, what characterizes that. I'm not going to get into it right now, but how we focus on it, how we try to sort of, you know, we do this for commercial clients is, um, you know, we focus on really trying to assess the risk to the enterprise, whatever, from an advanced attacker. Uh, and really what that is is, you know, after you gain initial access, um, what can you do? What can you find? What can you pillage? Um, can they catch you? Uh, can they see what an advanced attacker looks like uh, and get you out of the network, that kind of thing? Um, one note. In uh, most of the networks we do this in, they're Windows-based. That doesn't mean that we love Windows, although you'll see everything is Windows-based today. Um, and that's just because 99% of the corporate customers we have, when you get into their corporate environments, they're Windows-based. Uh, so that's what we focus on. And we, we love Windows. Um, I just had to get a slide in there that said Cyber Kill Chain. So. <laughs> Everybody has to drink. Yes, please, please drink now. Uh, the, the purpose of this is kind of just a, a methodology for for post exploitation, you know, uh, analysis in a in a red team environment. What we're trying to show here is this is nothing new. 
um, you know, everybody does this, think that, well, I don't want to say everybody does this, but it's done a lot, but it's not, what do you say? Oh, oh. okay. Uh, it, it's just done a lot, and, and um, it's nothing new, but the way that you do it maybe is. So. Cool. So kind of historically, a lot of, you know, these red teams have been defined kind of really specifically by the use of specialized tool sets, often more advanced than what's out there in public. And very, you know, most of the time, the way they could get this advanced tech is you have a really large team size, you have a lot of money, um, and you have a really kind of extended time frame. That's how the, you know, the really advanced attackers do it. You have to be able to fund this stuff and get the good tech. Our kind of interpretation is we want to push down some of that stuff and kind of bridge the gap a little bit from the pen testing to the military style red teaming. So our interpretation really is more about the emulation of techniques independent of the exact tool sets. You know, you don't need some piece of malware from some country outside the United States to, you know, at least kind of approximate some of these actions. And also, newer tools that have been released, things like um, you know, Cobalt Strikes Beacon, Immunity's Innuendo, to things like Mimikatz, Incognito, PowerSploit, all that type of stuff. Some of these new tools provide previously specialized capabilities. So the uh, kind of the open source tech is definitely advancing and lets us do a little better simulation. And again, like David mentioned, these techniques, you know, we're not dropping something that no one's ever seen before. Um, these techniques are public, but they're maybe not as well known as they could be or should be. Admins are always going to admin, users are always going to use, you know, they're, people are always going to take shortcuts in the whole usability versus security debate. You know, there's always going to be a way to abuse this kind of, you know, normal existing functionality and trust relationships for unintended purposes. And one of the key kind of themes we have in this presentation that we really want to push is that Everything here, like the underlying tactics, are all possible through multiple means, whether it's through VBScript, PowerShell, you know, which can make it a bit nicer and automate some stuff, um, but you can still do the same stuff using C, the Windows API, native tools. We like the term offense in depth to where if, you know, you have a tool that breaks or maybe PowerShell is disabled or AV catches you or something, you always need to be able to, like, drop to an alternative to achieve the same goal. So the first tactic, situational awareness, we have a... A Marine um, storming the beach, David insisted it be a Marine. He originally had somebody in the Army, which makes absolutely zero sense. <laughs> um, so the whole point with situation awareness, after you landed, you know, you landed on this beachhead, you have your one agent that's going over the network boundary. You want to orient yourself and get as much information as you can in order to facilitate additional compromise and lateral movement. So you, you get the situation awareness in order to plan your next steps. Again, there's nothing revolutionary here. The more information you can gather, the, gather, the more successful you'll be. Post information, domain information, and all that. Figure out the network architecture. Pretty basic stuff. One thing that um, people are starting to do more, I know Carlos had a talk on it this morning, but abusing Active Directory, it's a gold mine of information. There's a huge amount of stuff beyond just, you know, net.exe slash groups or something. So I'm going to talk about net.exe now. <laughs> um, all right, so we get we you know we get situ or we get access on a box. Uh, we want to learn a bunch of information more than what's here, but a couple pieces that um, can be really key for us uh, moving further in um, is getting information about users and groups um, in the domain so that we can get some more information about where we might want to target next. Um, we're also going to want to get uh, so you know information about hosts we can see so that we can start thinking about laterally moving, um, what else high value stuff is out there, and we want to get some specific information about those hosts. And just what we want to show on this slide is that um, you could do all, everything I just said straight with net.exe uh, in, the, in the like just a straight shell. So. Um, one of the, again, driving more into it, what do you, where do we want to go? Well, what we really want to target is high value users and their workstations. Because if we could get on their workstations, we could drop key loggers, we could see where they go, we could see where they drive drives, all kinds of fun stuff, right? And so, um, easy way to do this is to kind of abuse the net session functionality in Windows, um, where we can find the users that are logged, or logged into a system and the workstations that they're on. And you can just, you know, how do you do that? Well, you probably want to target their, like, file servers, places where everybody's connected to, because then you could dump that information from them. Um, you could do something like just net use on your current user, right? You look at the drives that are mapped, hit those hosts up um, for, with something like NetSesh, which has been out for, I don't know, 10 years, uh, and it'll just dump all that host information to you. And now I got the, uh, we matched that up against our user list we already did, and now we got 
high value users and the workstations that they're on. So a lot of the stuff that David just talked about, um, some of it was kind of wrapped up into a project released by Rob Fuller of Mubix, netview.exe, which was actually dropped at DerbyCon two years ago here. It's a C++ tool that uses, or enumerates systems using Windows API calls. So it'll do, you know, sessions, logged in users, shares, and all that kind of stuff. It'll dump all the stuff in the domain, shoot through it really fast. It spits out a lot of traffic. Um, now it did a poll and there's a little more functionality for checking share access and doing, you know, delays and jitters and stuff like that. But again, kind of just wrapped up a lot of the stuff that David talked about into one kind of nice tool you can drop. The newest school though, using PowerShell. PowerShell has some great active directory hooks already within it, and it has multiple ways to access the Windows API as well. The, one of the project, projects I'm going to be talking a lot about is PowerView, which is a situation awareness tool in PowerShell I wrote that implements a lot of this functionality without having to remember all this syntax. It has a full replacement for all the net.exe commands in case that's blocked. It has a full port of netview.exe with additional options and things like that. So these two functions I use the most on pen test and um, some red team engagements. So there's two ways that you can hunt for users on a network. Again, doing everything David said, but instead of doing it all by hand, just having a point click, having something chew, you know, chew through all the results and do it for you. The invoke user hunter, it'll enumerate all the machines and do those same kind of API calls. The big differences between these two is invoke user hunter will actually touch every single machine on the network. This is much noisier, but you're gonna get better coverage. The Stealth User Hunter does what David had mentioned, where it'll extract all the file servers from AD, all the user home directories, and do a sessions against each. This is much, much quieter. There's only a few, you know, calls to a, a few SMB calls to a file server. And you're able to get pretty good coverage where a lot of people are logged in on the network. By the way, funny story on PowerShell or PowerView is pretty much everything Will develops he did because he was pissed off about something. And we had a client that disabled net.exe. And Will's like, screw that. And he wrote it in PowerShell. So it's sort of funny. Uh, it's the way he writes tools, angry. Um, all right. And so. And rage code. Yeah, he rage codes. All right. So, um, second tactic is kind of abusing domain trust to move laterally around the, the network or the systems or subsidiaries or whatever. Um, it's sort of like abusing individuals through trust falls, I guess. I don't know. He's the one put the picture. Um, so quick, real down and dirty uh, uh, intro to, to Windows Domain Trust for anybody who's not familiar is trust basically allow you to set up two things or you know two entities to set up uh, trust between each other so they can access each other's resources. Um, you may do that because you have different business units or subsidiaries that merge. Who knows? Um, uh, the key thing to note is you're going through, uh, looking at, at trust is that all they do is allow a potential access into an, uh, a, a domain. They don't allow, you know, not every user from everyone can, can access it. You have to set that up too. Um, so you can't get too excited when you see like trust there. You're like, yeah, I'm everywhere. No, not quite. Um, and they're just another method to move around the network and abuse Windows functionality. We do that a lot. Uh, that's why we love Windows, to hurt it. Um, so trust kind of come in three different varieties. Uh, you know, I trust Will, uh, Will and I trust each other, or I trust Will, Will trusts somebody else, so I trust somebody else, right? Yay. Um, um, the, the, uh, it's important to note too, if you see Forest, and we'll talk about Forest a little bit with PowerView and how you can, you know, move around them, but, um, trusts are implicit within a Forest. Um, and like I so said, you could go over probably a 30 or hour, 30 minute or hour long conversation about this, but we're not going to. So, um, uh, Will has a pretty nice blog post he just put up that talks a lot about how we abuse trust relationships. All right, so why does it matter? Like I said, moving around to uh, to different business units, I get in one place and I want to start migrating to maybe more secure domains. Something we see a lot is when they have multiple security levels, they segregate that by domains that are in the same network. And so you're like, I have my secure domain and my not so secure domain. Uh, and then they set up trust between them because that's a good thing to do between security levels. And then, uh, and then you get to the higher security uh, uh, network through the trust relationships. Another thing to note real quick is that if you're at the root, at the top parent, and you find an enterprise admin and you don't think that's important, you're wrong, sir, because enterprise admins are gold. Oh, I'm not done yet. 
Um, so how do we, <laughs> right, how do we uh, uh, operationalize this? Uh, you know, trusts are great, how do we see them? Well, we have, some, Microsoft has some great tools out there that we just use to look at them, unless you're Will and you wrote something. Um, and so NL tests built into most systems. You just do NL tests, look at trusted domains, or domain trust, boom, tells you. I can enumerate some information in those other domains. I can use some other tools too, net DOM, DS query, DS get. We actually use an, a different tool, AD find in our demos. Um, here's just an example of using like DS query, DS get across domains, or across domains trust, so I can pull user information out of this, you know, other domain. Uh, I can pull group information, I can pull the members of those groups, all kinds of nice stuff, basically with native functionality. Cool, so again, common theme, uh, this is a lot easier, nicer to do in PowerShell. Using, I know the syntax looks a little wonky, so that's why you end up usually kind of loading up and using Power View. And you can enumerate all the trusts, you know, all the domains in a force and all that kind of stuff using these native Active Directory hooks. And a lot of the Active Directory functionality can very easily operate across trusts, just like David was talking about with the DS query stuff. So you can find your domain controllers, your users, and all that in a completely separate domain that your group happens to have a trust with. So you, for PowerView, to enumerate kind of all these domains, forests, and trust relationships and stuff, there's really nice little commandlets, just git forest, git forest trust, git net domain trust, which is kind of an equivalent of NL test. So I got tired of typing all the syntax out every time, so I can just load this up. There's a lot of options. I tried to make it, I think it's easy to use, but David doesn't. So uh, if a trust exists, most functions in PowerView can accept a dash domain or a dash forest flag. So you can operate all the normal functionality across a trust get all, all your domain controllers, get all your users, you know, with complete Active Directory objects, all the user information, searching the fields, running NetView, all that stuff will function really nicely uh, directly across the trust that you can enumerate. Cool. So the third we're going to go into, escalation and pivoting. We have our little screenshot from uh, friends, I think. Will really likes friends. Oh, yeah. So kind of moving beyond the beachhead. Now that you've mapped out your network, you know, you've really kind of abused Active Directory and gotten a bunch of user information. You've mapped your domain trust. You want to see kind of what mischief you can get into. Where can you move laterally? This is why we love Windows, because it really facilitates uh, lateral movement. The first step usually involves escalating the system on your target. If you want to play with LSAS, if you want to steal tokens, impersonate users, and do all that, you need to be running in God mode on the system. All right, so from an old school perspective, um, you know, we haven't always been able to type get system, and we, we still can't really, you're not always gonna be, or you often are not gonna be able to just drop some privilege escalation exploit on a box, unless you're cool and have zero days. Um, and so how do, you, how do you go and escalate the system when you don't generally just give up? Uh, you know, we find one of the most effective ways to do that is to do things like uh, look at big organizations um, like to, for some reason, write their own services, their IT support guys, it's like their thing to do. So you see all these custom services that have been deployed in these large organizations, and um, a lot of times they haven't secured them pr uh, properly. So um, the way you, you go about that is that you, you then look at all the services and where all their executables are, then manually go through every folder and check the permissions and um, on the, the files and the, the folders, or you do what Will did. It really made me angry because I've been trying to torture him a lot, and he keeps writing tools that get around my torture. It's annoying. Anyways, um, uh, once, you, uh, once you get system though, what do we want to do? We want to get user credentials so that we can move around the, uh, or user access so that we can move around to different systems on the network. Um, and how we primarily do that is probably through tokens. Not going to go a lot into uh, not going to go a lot into tokens, but um, you know what we really want is uh, is delegation tokens, which means somebody logged into the box. Uh, they give us some nice access that we can then migrate around to other places. Um, there's lots of ways you can attempt to do this. You know, like call the help desk and then try to get them to log into the box or you know whatever. Um, once we do that, though. We get them to log in, we got tokens, we can, um, you know, we can take those. There's lots of functionality out there, pretty much every framework, commercial otherwise, has, has the functionality to steal uh, Windows tokens, obviously the most popular out there is incognito. That's what pretty much everybody uses today, I think. And you can also just mig uh, migrate into a user's process, um, easy way to nab their token. So, again, David keeps saying, I keep writing these tools because he makes me go on assessments and do this stuff manually the old way and it gets really annoying. So Power Up is the result of one assessment where it's a PowerShell tool that automates a lot of these privilege escalation vectors that we were just talking about. 
the invoke all checks function will run every specific check in the entire script, which will check for vulnerable services, vulnerable service executables, um, the always run elevated, all that kind of stuff. Like the encyclopedia Prevesca just like went through after I wrote it and tried to implement as much stuff as possible. And one thing I didn't kind of mention yet, what's nice with this is that you can stay entirely off of disk with PowerShell and it's AV safe and all those nice normal reasons that you should be using it for post exploitation on Windows. And also there are functions in, uh, that will allow you to abuse whatever you find. So if you find a vulnerable service, you can abuse it to add a local admin. It's got pre-compiled service binaries already in the script that it'll write out and do all that kind of stuff. Again, while not built in functionality, you can do all this without touching disk. That was nice. New school for token manipulation, PowerSploit. It's an awesome offensive PowerShell post exploitation framework. The authors are actually right there. I he told me I had to call him by his handle, but I'm, no. uh, it's equivalent to incognito's functionality, but they implement it purely in PowerShell. It's really nice, but it's, you know, the same kind of stuff. You can impersonate tokens, create processes, enumerate everything on the box. Again, I keep repeating myself, all without touching disk. If you, hopefully everyone here knows what Mimi Cats is. If you don't, shame on you. But, uh, even better, the PowerSploit guys implemented everything in Mimi Cats all in PowerShell. So, I'm not going to go into all the Mimi Cat stuff, but you know, here you have a way to stay off of disk and let you dump the credentials, play with the Kerberos tickets, and do all that kind of stuff. Create your golden tickets and go have fun. All right. So, kind of fourth tactic. Um, those are funny slides for that. I like it. But um, fourth tactic, uh, looking at establishing persistence, this is one of the big uh, differences between, um, you know, what you might call a red team assessment and a penetration test is that we're actually establishing persistence in the network. Um, and there's a bunch of different ways you could go about and do this. Um, but generally the kind of characteristics you're looking for is you want to drop agents uh, that will call back or persist th uh, through reboots. Um, and again, there's a bunch of different ways you can do that, but you also want them to be low and slow, right? You want them to, to not get you, if your current activity gets caught, those backup agents won't necessarily get caught. Um, and you know, if you're on a, a month long or two month long assessment and you're not using persistent agents, life is going to be really difficult for you um, as soon as somebody reboots. So, you know, that's from a local perspective. From a network perspective, what you want is you want to keep that privileged access that you managed to get, and that's usually through credentials. There's a bunch of different ways that you could do that as well. Um, you know, you could just hang out on admin workstations uh, and just key log them, and every time they log in, there you got usernames and passwords, whatever. So, um, oh, I got ahead of myself, apparent, excuse me. Um, another thing to, to note, that's important from a red team operation standpoint is that stay away from those main servers, stay away from the domain controllers, stay away from file servers, at least putting agents on them, that kind of thing, because that's where people are looking. They very rarely look at workstation land, right? So um, if you go persist there, hang out, get your accesses, uh, it's a lot harder to remove you from the network because the, your agents are doing things that they would expect them to do, like call out over HTTPS and that kind of thing. A server shouldn't be doing that, and a, uh, a workstation could. So. Well, so a big thing here, you know, this tactic hasn't changed. You know, it's still really good to throw up a low and slow uh, persistent agent that, you know, ideally operates in memory and maybe you drop kind of an obfuscated version to disk. What kind of has changed a little bit is there have been uh, a wider variety of public tool sets now that will actually let you run these types of more advanced agents with, you know, longer reach back intervals, a lot quieter, things like Cobalt Strikes Beacon, Amenities Innuendo, Silent Breaks Throwback. You know, all this stuff is out there so you can kind of bring a little more advanced capability than you're previously um, capable of. For on disk local persistence, you know, these aren't all, this isn't a dictionary persistence techniques or anything. The point here is you can kind of uh, link up some PowerShell stuff with scheduled tasks or whatever else and, you know, get some kind of new uh, persistent options that don't involve always dropping a binary to disk. We like trying to stay off disk as much as we can. Sometimes though, for, you know, reboot persistence, you do need to, need to touch something. But for domain persistence, there's nothing better than a golden ticket. I'm not going to go hugely into this. You should definitely go see Chris's talk at 6 p.m. and watch the Black Hat presentation from uh, all the Kerberos abuse. But if you can knock over a domain controller and you can grab the curb TGT hash, you can forge your own Kerberos tickets for any user and put them in any group 
And for as long as that hash hasn't changed, you can even create users that don't exist and put them in domain admins and access things with it, and there's no record of that user being created, just accessing resources. It's pretty scary. But uh, long story short, if you can knock, or, knock over a domain and get domain admin, you can own a domain for a long, long time. Think, you know, years. Like, this is a real domain. Uh, the current DGT account hasn't changed for over a decade. So if anyone had knocked over that domain in the last 10 years, even if they didn't know about this attack, they can go back through the records and if they have that curb TGT hash, they have domain admin in that domain still. So once I kind of got the full implications of this, this definitely scares me. And there's no, Microsoft doesn't have a mitigation for it officially at this point, so you're just kind of out of luck. All right, so kind of final tactic we're going to uh, go over um, is sort of the whole point of what we would call a red team operation, which is um, actually, there's a lot of files, uh, actually uh, getting to data, right? You know, we get domain admin, we get persistence, we get all this cool technical stuff, we're high-fiving each other, and we still haven't done anything for the, for the customer, right, except show them that we can get access. Um, so to really demonstrate risk on a, on a network, you need to get data. Uh, in a Windows environment, data is usually files, right? So there's files, lots and lots of files, thousands upon thousands upon millions of files. And you need to sort through all of these manually um, so that you can find cool data. Right, right Will? Manually? Anyways, um, there's a few different ways you can do this. Um, mainly, though, you just, you know, something super simple. You just do like a net view slash domain like you saw before, dump all the uh, the hosts out, and then just start going through them, look at what shares they have access to, uh, or look at what shares you have access to, what files are in those, or what folders in those shares, what files are in those folder, folders, you kind of get the idea. Um, and oh, one thing that David didn't mention is that there's kind of two different perspectives for this too. There's data mining and looking for files after you have a large amount of privilege access. And there's also looking for like improperly uh, secured shares or data that you can access as a user for the purposes of escalation. So, like most organizations have really terrible share permissions that you can find really juicy, sensitive stuff. But then also once you actually get admin on a file server or something like that through DA or otherwise, you want to try to mine and find the really juicy stuff. Another thing to, uh, to mention is that folders are really hard to secure, right? So, um, uh, folder permissions, file permissions, they're kind of a pain in the butt to uh, keep up to date, especially in these really large environments with, you know, dozens of file servers, all this kind of stuff. So let's say you don't get DA in an environment. You know, it happens sometimes. You just can't seem to escalate your access. You can still jump around and see what kind of folders you have access to and, you know, find some pretty juicy stuff that makes them think that you hacked them. You're like, well, not really. You just viewed your network shares, but whatever. Um, so you know, once you once you kind of look at what the shares are, then you need the 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 file listings, the directory listings. You just do a recursive directory listing against the share, dump that all to a text file that's like you know a gig or 500 megs, or whatever. And then pull that back. That doesn't take very long, and um, and then just go through the uh, the folders, see what's interesting. You know, grep for like I don't know password secret. Not really, but um, but go through all that stuff, uh, see what's interesting, pull that down, um, and you make all the new guys do it who wanted to be hackers, and you watch them do that 40 hours a week and break them, or or that doesn't work, and then Will screws you. So with PowerView, uh, there's one function that I use a lot to help find these open shares and search for files. So the invoke share finder, it'll enumerate AD for all the machines, We'll get all the shares in every machine that are active in the domain. And there's a check access flag, so this will return just a listing of all the shares that you have read access to in the entire network. Again, this is pretty noisy. Uh, we'll kind of smash and grab this on a pen test. We try to do a little more targeted if we're doing long-term engagements. There's options for delays and jitters and, you know, host restrictions and all that kind of stuff. And you can pipe the output of this file into some additional functionality that will do file searching. Once you have shares, this is kind of PowerShell's version of the dir slash s, but it's a lot nicer. So this will do a recursive listing on a remote machine and path and spit out a CSV file with the, the file, with the last access time, the creation time, and the owner. So you can sort the entire thing by last access time. What you actually care about is not files that are 10 years old that nobody's touched. You want to know what people are actually working on. You can also instead of just dumping every single file and then trying to grep for everything, these are who can get really large, 
you can pass multiple terms in this include flag, which will essentially search file names for specific wildcard terms. So this really kind of pairs down what your result set's going to be. And all this functionality, because I didn't want to type this every time, it's um, invoke file finder that'll go out and find this stuff. Invoke search files, you can feed it a path. And it has a lot of stock kind of terms like password, secret, whatever, DMDK, and things like that. Last thing I'm kind of talking about. So one way that people can escalate stuff is if you're on a network, you find shares that you have right access to. And you find executables on those shares that are recently accessed by people. You can backdoor them, same with Office Docs. You know, drop them on and kind of wait for the shells to come back. So the invoke search files and file finder stuff in PowerView has a dash fresh exes flag. There's also filtering for all the date and access stuff so you can do this manually. If you pass this by default and a path, it'll find all the executables on a path that have been accessed within the last week. And you can use Joshua Pitts's The Backdoor Factory. He's actually presenting right now in one of the other rooms. Cool guy. It's uh, kind of like a binary patching and backdooring framework. You can use this tool to easily trojanate these executables. And then you can use some functionality that I stole from Chris that actually will clone the Mac attributes when you copy a file back. So you can replace it. All the Mac is the same. Um, hopefully nobody notices, and then you can just have uh, shells that come back. Cool. We're I'm, now going to play Street Fighter. I'm Blanca. No. Because I get to be right. Yeah. You, you got to. Yeah. I'm confused. I'm confused. Okay. All right. Talk about the demo. So, no, I'm not going to talk about the demo. We're now going to do a bunch of command line stuff, and you guys are going to get very confused. We're not going to talk about it. No. Um, so we have a kind of a demo just to walk through, as we said at the beginning, uh, to walk through kind of what we just talked about with these different tactics. Uh, in our simulated demo environment, it's a multi-domain environment, um, and we really want to go after high-value users, uh, i.e. managers, because they speak the language of business, and it's amazing. Um, and uh, so anytime we see managers, yay, right? Uh, we'll say this demo is very abbreviated, obviously, so that we can get it in like 10 minutes. Um, but I'm going to go kind of the old school way to do it, uh, and then Will's going to go through kind of the new school way to do it and embarrass me, which I don't know why I did this presentation, because the whole thing was about embarrassing me. So who's the loser now? But we're starting with um, we have an agent already on a machine for a non-privileged user in the domain. We do? Yep. Are you sure? Domains. So just the, again, the basic stuff, kind of targeting the the domain admins group. All right. So yeah. So um, so you know, domain admins. We said those are pretty valuable users um, in this group. It looks like we got one domain admin. His name. Well, we got the default one, but one new one. His name's Chris. So if we see Chris, that should be good, right? This domain. Uh, we should probably let you know that we're in a dev domain right now. So we're in like a, a child domain because I don't know. It's a developer clicked on our email. Whatever. Um, all right, so you know, we, we did we we searched for some users. This is some basic stuff. Now I want to search for some computers. Look, I got I got hosts in my network. Yay! Um, my access I have right now. I don't know what kind of kind of access I have in the network. I'd like to see what other hosts I can access. I'd probably do things like this. Not dry. Or uh, you know, I do a, a dir against the C dollar sign, which tells me if I have admin access or not. Um, I would do this against all of them, but for the sake of expediency, do it against one. Look, the user I have now it happens to be a local admin on another box. That's cool. That lets me know that um, that I can install an agent, which you know is the way to do it. You should always go around every box you see and install agents because having lots of agents out there is really cool. Um, this has already been set up, but we're going to use our current access that we had that we just checked to uh, PS exec to that box. So. What session am I yeah, here? Session. Yeah, what session is it? Uh, just tab. Tab? No, uh, that didn't work. Session space tab. 16? All right. That's a lot of sessions. All right, so we set our session to our current one, um, and then we just exploit because Will already got it all in there, and I'm happy. So now this is going to work. I know it's going to work because I have admin access on that box, if I spelled it right. All right, so... Use P we use uh, our current user, psexec, we drop a shell, we, we got access to this other box. Um, now we want to know some information, obviously we probably drop to a command line now and look a bunch at what kind of accesses we have, but um, again, for the sake of expediency, 
one thing I want to know is what other users might be logged into that box, right? Uh-oh. Oh, wait a second. Smirnoff, really? Really? At DEF CON they have you do shots. No, no, you would be nice to drink it now. <laughs> really? Drink it like a man. Or the 17 year old girl you are barely meant to be. I'm... Ugh. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> I believe I just had a flashback to when I was 15. Oh. That's terrible. <laughs> Baby. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, if anybody's wondering, uh, uh, Dave Kennedy and I once almost got arrested because I was feeding him alcohol when he was underage. It is a true story, unfortunately. <laughs> It was also a long time ago. Anyways, um, all right, so we see that this guy, Chris, remember Chris? Chris was a cool guy. Uh, he happens to be logged into this box right now. Um, I happen to be system because I was an administrator. So I want to take his access. I could have done that token stuff, but as Will said, I can just migrate into his process. Uh, yes. Thank you, Armitage. Rafi, your tool's taking too long. All right, uh, so now I can drop to a command prompt. We can do it right. I'm sorry, now I feel drunk because I just drank a gigantic spirit on it. All right, so look, I'm Chris. Yay. So um, now I know I'm a domain admin in this, this domain. I could do whatever I wanted, but what I really want is another domain. Remember, um, we want to jump to trust because that's what we talked about in this. So we kind of cheated a little bit again for expediency. We we dropped uh, ad find and net slash exe already onto the box. This is the kit that you would normally have right. to upload manually. Because along with dropping agents on every box, you need to drop lots of executables. Um, again, this entire presentation is basically made to make things look stupid. So I don't understand why <laughs> I'm doing this. Anyway, <laughs> um, all right. So we drop ad find. What we want to know is more information. We want to get all the the Active Directory attributes of this user. Chris. What we see here is if I scroll up a little bit, um, is that he's a member of domain admins. We knew that, but he's also a member of this other uh, group, workstation admins, in a different domain, which is pretty useful to us, especially since it says workstation admins. That seems juicy. Um, I'd like to see what other domains I see out there. And I see that there is a trust involved, or there is a trust relationship. I kind of knew that because there is a parent. Uh, so I'm a subsidiary of a parent, and there's a intrinsic trust relationship. Yay! Uh, let's see, so let's see what else I can do against that uh, network. I'd like to see here. I'm going to drop all the groups. Uh, and again, this is being queried across the trust. So right. So I want to see all the groups in this trust, this domain, this uh, trusted domain, and I see that um, there's some regular groups, but there's a couple that were just made, this workstation admins, that's handy, that seems interesting. And then there's this managers group, which is super interesting because member managers are awesome and speak language of business. Sorry, I can't help myself, whatever. If anybody's wondering, I actually just, I spent like a week in like business camp, it was terrible. So if you're wondering why I'm like, <laughs> I'm surprised he can even. Right, I, I'm surprised I can do anything right now, and uh, and I, if I hear the language of business one more time, I might cut myself. <laughs> so um, so there's this managers group. I want to see who's in that group. Um, obviously, this isn't that pretty. That's a hint that something cooler might be coming. Uh, but there's this there's this member, Jason F. Jason F is probably an interesting user to me. Um, so I'm going to in a second. Uh, see where I can find him. And what I want to do now is I want to find the host in that network. This is sort of like NetView, but it's NetView across the trust relationship. Again, this is all was just straight AD find. Uh, and I see that there's three work or there's three hosts in this network. Uh, there's uh, two workstations and what looks like a domain controller. So that should be pretty interesting. Um, I want to do something like NetSesh. Remember that uh, against primary. yeah primary. And I see that there is a couple of users that are logged into this box, Jason F being one of them. 
that's really cool because because uh, now I know where our our manager is located. And now I was a workstation admin, so I may have access into his box. Hint. And I do, so that's really cool because now I can just go over here. I can set my session to be my new session that I opened. I can uh, set my host to my new guy. And then and I get a, a callback in a second on the ghost. So again, remember we want to drop as many agents as humanly possible. Uh, and if you see here, we're going to start poking around. Uh, I want to see who's logged in. I see Jason F is logged in, and that's cool. Now I get to watch him forever or whatever. All right, go ahead. Show me up. All right. This this is the cool stuff. So what? Mine was really cool too. I've got this. I stole this from Chris. But real hackers don't use Windows. I'm actually going to do everything just straight from the Windows prompt without actually touching anything to disk. So I'm going to start at PowerShell and net.web. Do you want some water, man? Because that was terrible. I know. Yeah, it was terrible. So I'm going to do this little uh, invoke expression download cradle that will take my PowerShell attack toolkit, which has invoke Mimi cats and some PowerView stuff, host it on an external site. Also load it all up into memory. Well, we should probably mention that he's sitting on the, the workstation that I had that agent yeah. on. Yeah, so I'm going to try hunting for those common users. And this check access flag will actually check if you have admin access to every box that you find where there's the, the target user in. You can specify user lists, usernames, domain groups, and all that kind of stuff. By default, it's going to query for domain admins, uh, query AD for all the machines, and then do that enumeration to every machine in the domain. Cool. I see lots of stuff coming back. I see Chris has a session from here and he's logged into there and all that good stuff on Windows 4. So I'm going to use invoke Mimi Cats along with Windows Remoting, which is enabled in this domain, which will let me run this PowerShell script remotely on a machine entirely in memory and get the results back. Go. Cool. So we've got, let's see, Chris's password, Damien Emin. I like passwords. That's really secure. Thank you, PowerSploit, because being able to run Mimi Cats over the network in memory is just about amazing. Yeah. So let's see. I'm gonna. <laughs> Those guys, not us. Just... Oh wait, no. One second. Let's see. Uh, hold on. I want to. Chris is like, why do you keep calling us out? Because we did the entire presentation off the so. Cool. So I'm going to start up another PowerShell instance that's using uh, Chris's credentials. I could do some other, like, you know, uh, inject logon creds or, like, you know, do the incognito style uh, stealing credential stuff, but this is just a little easier. So now I'm, uh, now I'm dev Chris. I'm that domain admin. And I'll get that user. So I'm going to get a little more information on. Oh, first, I need to. He needs to reload his uh, his toolkit, basically, in his new PowerShell. Thank you. Yeah, execution policy just stopped us. We're completely out of luck because it's really good security. So I'm gonna load up the kit again. I'm gonna get net user what my current user is. I think this is the exact same information that David was able to get. It's just a lot nicer. I don't have to remember all the DS query stuff. This will actually re return, you know, the complete user object. I can just pull out the, the member of. I see the same information with the workstation admins and all that kind of stuff across the trust. So I'm going to get net domain trust. Just like in L test, you see there's a trust for this target domain. Let's see what else. Oh, yeah. Get net groups. Domain. I didn't do all that stuff I did with AD fine, but yep. It's nicely I can I can pass that dash domain flag, it'll operate across the trust that's existing. See the same stuff that David did with this manager's domain. And I don't even have to query that group to get all the users. Um, kind of straight out. I can actually just pass for user hunter, pass it that group name, pass it that domain. And flag, oh yeah, check access. And do that check access to see if I have admin access on any of the targets. Again, doing all that stuff David was doing, but like 
this point and click with a couple options, you get the same information. So here, JSONF is logged into Windows 2. I'm gonna, I see you have admin access in the box and I'm actually gonna go a step further and do invoke search files, which will do those recursive listings I was talking about. I think it's terms. I'm gonna search for anything that has the word business in it. Because it's the link, never mind. Yeah, it's the link, yeah. Okay, here we go. This actually did that recursive grepping for off of uh, C$ dollar users, finding any file that has this wild called card terminate. Then I'm going to, well, first I'm gonna change into C temp. I'm gonna copy that file, copy it off. And that's we, the target. Now we have their entire business plan. Yep. Establish economics. Yeah. Cool. Good. And that's pretty much it. Um, so, just kind of to recap. <laughs> Awkward clap. Just kind of recap. Again, newer tools and techniques can kind of help facilitate in those red team engagements, but the underlying tactics haven't really changed. These things are still really effective. It's also always good to have a backup plan. You know, if PowerShell's disabled or if AV's hitting certain tools or something, you always want to be able to have a backup. But uh, yeah, moral of the story, underlying tactics really change, yeah. the implementations can. I think, I think the other thing that's important for the, or the, to note is that if you notice, a lot of the stuff that he did is really quick and we're, uh, you're able to bring some of these more advanced tactics potentially that took a lot of steps before. You can bring them more into your, like your pen test, your limited time frame engagements and really do a lot more um, in the time frame that you have. Kind of demonstrate how bad they are. And we have some of the offensive PowerShell blogs with uh, obscure security and manifestations blogs to exploit Monday. Um, dark, <laughs> dark operator and all that kind of stuff. And some of the tool sets we covered with PowerSploit, PowerView, and PowerUp. We're going to post these slides on SlideShare soon and then tweet out a link to them. So, yep. Cool. Uh, any questions? We have like four minutes. Yeah, we have four minutes for some questions. No questions. Yes. So at least as I understand it with PowerShell now, um, the uh, there'll be like a forensic footprint that you started PowerShell on the machine, but um, you can't actually introspect within it and see what you were doing inside of it from an instant response perspective. It is very, the thing is like now with newer versions of Windows with PowerShell baked in, admins use it, lots of people use it, you know, there's, there's a version of Windows Server 2012 to where you can only use PowerShell to admin components of it because it's headless. So, so you, you are going to get a lot of logging if you're going out and like doing certain like file, you know, network share searching and what do you have access to and all those kind of stuff. It's going to generate logs on those workstations, but I, I hate to say it, we haven't seen an organization yet that collects all of the logs from all of their workstations and then actually like, I don't know, puts them together or aggregates them in some useful manner. So yeah, yeah theoretically that would work though. That'd be great. Cool. All right. That's it. Oh, that was disgusting. That was really good. I feel like fuck. I felt like woozy after. I felt woozy just because it was smeared on ice. And it was warm. Ugh. <laughs>